Up next, we have Yegi Bonyadi and Min Zhang from Lyra Electronics and Mac One, who are going to be doing a workshop for us, GAN and SICK transistors, fight or flight, getting EMC ready for the next generation of power electronic devices. Um, we're going to do a two-hour workshop today titled GAN or silicon carbide transistor, fight or flight. So the uh, goal of the session is to give you an understanding of um, the best practices, the guidelines, and some valuable insight on how to design and test your products, especially the one that use wide band gap devices such as GAN and silicon carbide, and how to take your product from design all the way to EMC compliance. So talking about the title of the presentation, uh, we know that some, uh, well, I, I'm sure that you all know that, uh, the advantages of using wide band gap devices in products. But we've seen that some uh, engineers, when they use these um, devices, they don't think about EMC in the beginning of their design, and later on where they're testing, they face some challenges. And then instead of approaching the flight mode, they go through flight mode, so they just change it either with silicon MOSFETs or get scared because they need to use big filters. So they decide, they decide on just to abandon using the wide band gap devices. So today, Min and I will be telling you what to think ahead of time when you're designing and what considerations you need to have in mind. So just a little bit of background about Min and I. So um, I'm from Lyra Electronics. Um, I work as an electronics team lead uh, in Lyra. We do uh, what we work with, we're like a consultancy company. We do design products uh, for automotive application and other application as well. The main thing that my, myself and my team are working on are automotive, uh, like DC DC converters, onboard chargers, and uh, power inverters. And we do lots of products for a hybrid and electric vehicle. And that's how we met as well. Min and I, when, he, was, when was it? Like around two, hour, two years ago when we first. Yeah, when we first started working together. Um, and then, uh, so Min as well, he's um, principal and founder and principal EMC consultant of Mac One Design. Uh, it's a UK-based engineering firm. He specializes in EMC consulting, training, and troubleshooting. And this session today will be kind of like an interactive session. So we'll just do, I'll do some slides, Min will do some slides, and then we'll be like, like how we actually work together when we're doing real work in back, at, uh, back at, in the UK. So that will be how we're going to present this training today. <clears throat> okay, yeah, let's just do a quick uh, questionnaire. How many of you sitting here today have had challenges or issues with electronic noise or interference during your product or project development stage? Those who have the issues or challenges, raise your hands. Okay. and. How many, so for those who haven't raised your hand, have you ever heard about EMC and what it means for EMC when we say electromagnetic compatibility? Do you, do you understand it? Okay. Okay, so half, half. So half yeah. of the engineers had an experience, experience dealing with EMI and half who haven't come with uh, any issues. Yeah. So that's a, that's good, a good start. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, so. Just going to give you a little bit of uh, outline of the workshop. Um, so first, I'm going to talk to you about EMI challenges that are associated with using wide band gap devices, what to look for, what to, do you need to do when you're trying to troubleshoot uh, your product. And then I'll, uh, Min will start uh, talking about grounding, parasitics, and cu coupling mechanisms. So he'll take you through those um, parts. And then um, I'll start again with some benchtop testing that um, I've done, and uh, I'll talk, talk to you what you need to think about when you want to do your um, testing in, in your lab, and then later on when you're ready to go to a chamber, to a test house, what you need to do when you want to take that approach. And then um, Min will also continue with design strategies and how to achieve EMC compliance, and then we'll do a case study where we worked on together on an automotive DC-DC converter. And at the end, we'll do a Q&A session as well. And since since it's a quite interactive session, so we don't mind if you have any questions. Yes, if you right. during the presentation, just raise your hand, and we'll try to answer the question. Yeah. Okay. So, GAN and silicon carbide transistor. Um, you know that they are now being used in many applications. I've just put two photos on there. 
one on the top left is a GAN charger that is um, uh, actually it's a, around a 108 watt charger and on the bottom is Lyra's uh, 22 kilowatt silicon carbide bidirectional onboard charger. So we've been using silicon carbide in many of our products and uh, we've been using them for years now. We've also got some products which have used GAN devices in them as well. And as you know that these uh, devices can be used in um, any application from marine, military, automotive and also in home appliances, motor drive and so on. Okay, so uh, what I'm showing here is a simplified <coughs> schematic of a um, phase shift full bridge DC DC converter where you see that we've got a conversion from high voltage to low voltage. Uh, on the high voltage side, it's either 400 or 800 volts, so it's quite high voltage, which means that you need to use bigger packages, you know, higher voltage rating FETs um, over there. So that's a challenge in terms of cost that you will need to use in your design. And also with high current, there will be uh, challenges as well. So as you can see, we've highlighted the high DI by DT current group associated with the high currents on the output side. And on the, those two uh, dots that I've uh, highlighted are now showing you the uh, high dB by DT noise that we, have, uh, we can have here as well. In your product, you might have overshoots, you might have ringing, depending on your design. And later on, we'll explain how you can um, tackle those problems as well. But uh, the thing that you need to take away from this is that if you use silicon cardboard, you start, or GAN, you start switching faster, you will have high, higher dB by DT and DI by DT events, which means worse EMI uh, and more pr problems that you will have. Okay, so, um, let, so let's, look, let's, let's look at this slide. So this is showing three different switching events. And on the right-hand side, you can see the, this in terms of um, and in the frequency domain. So they're showing near-field measurements of these switching events. So they're correlated with the color correlated with the ones on the left-hand side. And as you can see, the, um, from left to right, the switching frequency of these switching events are now increasing. Something I want... I hope I, I wish I had a pointer that I could point to, but if I explain to you where I want you to look at, there are two corner points there. One, the first one is where this arrow, uh, dashed arrow, is, uh, you know, is showing this trend. Uh, that's corner point one, which is now is actually related to the switching frequency of your devices. The faster it switches, the more it will be pushed to the right hand side, meaning that it will cover more uh, spectral content of high frequency. And if you look here, you can see that the 8, 600 volt, for example, uh, traces the pink and blue. Uh, the switching frequency of the blue one is higher, double the other one. So that is now being pushed to the right hand side, which means it's around 3 to 6 dB higher. And noise compared to if you switch slower. Another thing is the corner point, I'm going to call it corner point 2, which is the bottom side, uh, the bottom point. Um, as you s start increasing the switching edges and the speed that you switch the MOSFETs, um, you will be uh, pushing that corner point again to the right hand side, meaning again that you will have higher frequency content, which is not something we want for EMC because it will be more difficult to tackle them and then fix them. So, um, but then again, there's a conflict because you want to use a uh, wideband gap to start switching fast, and then if you want to start switching fast and have faster edges, then you have more problem with EMI. But then if you start slowing them down, they will have more loss problem. So you need to find a trade-off in your product. What do you want to do and what is the best approach? Okay, so and here, normally in conducted emission tests, you will see uh, a hump, we call it, between 10 to 30 megahertz hump, especially if your device is connected to the mains grid. In this example, on the left-hand side, you can see that orange block is the listen you will use for voltage measurement of your device. And then you have a cable connected to that. That will be your DUT, the big grayish box. Uh, so the cable will connect your DUT to the listen. And then inside your DUT, you will have capacitances, parasitic capacitances, for example, choke self capacitance, leakage, in, leakage inductance. And in the whole circuit, along with the test measurement, you have lots of LNC. So you, you will basically have a resonant circuit. So um, if you have switches that switch fast, then they will excite this resonant circuit. For example, if you use silicon carbide, you'll be uh, seeing these frequencies, you know, these humps. As you start increasing the switching frequency, these will correlate with these peaks that you see there. Min has got a nice presentation kind of testing that he's done. He's going to talk to you about 
uh, this one now, yeah. which would yeah, explain it a bit more. Yeah, so basically what you see here, as Yegi said, this is a, because I'm just trying to explain to those people who are not familiar with EMC testing. So in terms of the emission test, which is whatever the, the noise, the electronic noise that your product generates, you don't want that emission to contaminate the nearby equipment. And to do that, normally we do two tests. One is what we call conducted emission test. Well, sounds quite uh, straightforward, it's conducting, right? And then the other one is, is some people more familiar with, which is a radiated emission test. So that's something where you test it using a far field measurement antenna, and you pick up noise often within three or 10 meter distance. And here we are troubleshooting a conducted emission failure. And as you can see, in this particular product, it's a pump, if I can remember. Um, it's a UK-based company, and they failed conducting emission. And as you can see there, there are two lines in this uh, plot. The lower limit is the average limit, and the higher limit is the what we call quasi-peak limit. But as you can see, this is an average scan, and the uh, resonance hump already hit the quasi-peak limit line, meaning it fails at least 10 dB in this case. And often, you know, when you see a failure like this, it is quite hard to fix. It's quite hard to fix. For one thing is, in this particular product, it's a pump. So as you can imagine, in this product, there will be a power factor correction circuit in the front, and then there will be three-phase motor drive circuit. And then, of course, to provide the power, you need switch mode power supplies, often doing whatever, 24 volts, 15 volts, 3.3 volts, all sorts of circuits, and they all switching. So how do you know which circuit in that product creates this resonance? As Yegi said, any switching can excite this structure, which is a resonance circuit. So one of the techniques I often use during troubleshooting, as you can see here, is I use a, what we call radio frequency current monitor probe. You can see that there, unfortunately today we don't have a pointer, but you can see there the, the, the blue thing, like a donut shape, that's a current probe. And you can connect this probe to channel one using 50 ohm termination. And then channel two, what we do is we use a near field probe. I um, apologize for the uh, picture because it's not clear. You can see there the channel two actually is connected to a near field probe, which we'll demonstrate later. And then what you, what you do is you clamp the current probe on the mains cable, as you can see there. That's your mains cable. You measure it in a time domain. Then you can often see noise in a, real t in a real time domain, as we can see here. That's channel one. And then what you do is you have a near field probe. And then you hold this near field probe, scanning the whole product, put into circuitry where you suspect that can be the problem, be the noise source. And then once you see that they resonate at the same frequency, which you can see there, the blue trace and yellow trace, and also sometimes when you flip the probe, they change phase. Then you know, okay, okay, that means this current and this current matches, okay? So that's a very powerful troubleshooting tool, and Yegi later will demonstrate you and how Lyra implemented it. But really, and another point I wanted to make is that if you just measure the peak-to-peak -peak, uh, time interval, that gives you the time interval, and then you do one over time, gives you frequency. Then, surprisingly or not, that frequency, guess what? Is this 10 megahertz ringing frequency measured in a spectrum domain? So that's how you really connect the time domain and frequency domain together, okay? And we can say about the, uh, for example, on the DC DC converter, you will still see these hump, but it will be an FM band, a different frequency range. So you will always find this double, bond, double hump or this hump in the either FM band or 10 to 30 megahertz. This is also yours, man. So yeah, following um, this, now let's look at another product. So this product is a charger. As we know now with the electrification, lots of charging um, products in the market. In the UK, I was helping at least just this year, at least five, to five, five charging companies from big to small. And this is a big charger where you often see outside Tesco. Um, anyway, initially you can see they also failed conducting mission. And again, there's a AV, that means average line. So you can see the results hitting 
or exceeding the, the limit line. And this is interesting because for such a big power uh, products, in this case, if I can remember, 200 kilowatts at least, at least. And you will see, in order to cool the devices, in this case, right, all the, uh, the, the devices, switching devices, are bonded to the heat sink with a thin thermal paste. And what happens is then this heat sink needs to be grounded or earthed. Uh, then again, you know, it depends on how you use the term. It's, some people say earth, some people say grounded. Earth to the um, what we call pr um, uh, PE line, okay, PE line, protection earth line, highlighted in, in green in this case. And this is interesting, this is interesting because when you hit a switch hard, meaning hard switching very fast, what happened is, think about it, this device and the heat sink basically forms a big capacitance. And we, know, we all know capacitance really is just two conducting parts in between sandwich with the insulation layer, right? So you can see it that the current, this high frequency current injected into the heat sink, which is in this gray area. And then you connected this heat sink to the earth. So there will be a what we call common mode current loop. But what I wanted to highlight in this case is, traditionally speaking, most of the time, most of the time, uh, when I worked on other products, we often say, you know, if you look at the noise, you look at the lower frequency. When we say lower frequency, it's often between nine kilohertz to, say, two or three megahertz. So in this frequency range, you say most of the noise are differential mode. And then beyond three megahertz noise is all common mode noise, which causes lots of problems. But in this case, you even see, you can even see at 150 kilohertz, often, you know, as we define as lower frequency range, lots of common mode current, which is quite difficult to tackle, right? In, uh, that's the challenge we're facing with all these big power charger or similar products. Okay, so, uh, so now we'll talk about radiated emissions. Um, something to uh, know is that if you have uh, your device and you have conducted emission no noise, your cables will act as an antenna. So if, for example, in the case on the bottom right, that's the picture of the DC-DC converter. Let me just go next, yeah. So that, that is the picture where it was um, tested before any improvement on the filtering was done. So the box itself, the DC-DC converter was noisy. The cables that were coming out of it, which are the HV and LV cables, were acting as antenna, and the top, the graph on the top, is showing you how we fa we failed both um, the, the radiated emissions in both horizontal and vertical um, uh, orientation of the antenna. So that's quite important to know that your cables will radiate. So make sure that you block the noise before it comes out, or bring the noise limit down uh, enough for you to pass the the test. And on the left side is the test that Min's done on one of his motor drives. Uh, was, what, was the t what was the length of the cable? I think this is where the cables were radiating. They were around three meter length, Sorry. yeah, long cables, uh, which were radiating. And if you look on the uh, left corner of the spectrum, you can see how they, uh, the noise was quite high. I think, was, was it the quasi-peak uh, uh, noise? Quasi-peak, yeah, the, the limit was, past, was failing the limit by more than 15, 20 dB. And uh, if you look at the uh, frequency, you will see that this three meter length you know, correlates with that frequency where it's actually failing in the radiated emissions uh, test. Yeah, so speaking of motor drive, I understand um, some people here are, you know, doing motor drive application. So um, just this year, I, again, I worked on a few motor drive products, and the previous case we show you there is a uh, two motor drive connected together. One's doing motor drive and the other doing regen. And if you're not doing the cable arrangement properly, as, as we ex uh, explained, three meter long cable, if you work out the math, that often radiates quite in you know, like 10 to 30 or 50 megahertz range. And we normally started testing such product from 30 megahertz, so that's a problem. Um, so we are all familiar with time domain measurement, right? So as you can see here, again, we're showing you a time domain measurement of a typical phase currents that you can measure in a typical motor driver application. And this is from Rockwell Automation based in the United States many years ago. I like this because if you really uh, 
try to look into the details. So what we can do is we can treat the whole current wavelength time domain into four parts. Of course, the first part is your fundamental part, which is directly proportional to your uh, motor speed, right? The number of poles and how you drive it. But then, of course, if everything is perfect, then you would uh, arrive at a perfect sinusoidal waveform. But we all know that's not the case. You will always have some low order harmonics, such as the third, fifth, depends on how you uh, wind the motors and things like that, right? So you get some harmonics, and these are often low frequency, well, at least from an EMC or RF engineer point of view. And then, of course, we, we, are, we, are, we need to drive the motor, so we, we need to design whether it is an H bridge for single phase or um, three phase motor drive circuits, and then inevitably you introduce switching noise, and these can be observed immediately, as you can see there, with little spikes. But what people don't know or often overlook is these big spikes. You can see in the graph, sometimes you've got huge spikes, and it's quite what we call narrow bands. If you do the FFT, you will find it's at very high frequency. And what, what can cause these spikes in a motor drive application? Well, normally there are two types of uh, failure that can, can lead to this. One is a bearing current discharge. So if you're, unless you're using ceramic bearing, if you're just using a, uh, a, a metal bearing, right? And if you look at a bearing, bearing sits in a grease, and the grease is, is basically an insulation layer. Again, here we have a perfect capacitor. And as your motor is spinning at particularly high speeds, you start to accumulate this electro, electrostatic charge. And at one point, at one point, you will find a way to discharge the current. It's, it's pretty much like the ESD uh, event we experienced. So that's one source of this high, uh, high frequency spikes. And then the other source is uh, due to uh, how you control it. So on the, on the drive circuit, if you are using, say, MOSFET, silicon-based MOSFET, then you, you could sometimes have this body diode. And depends on how you free wheel the system, you could have what we call reverse recovery charge. And in that scenario, you also see some spikes. But luckily for us, hopefully, in the future, we all move to silicon carbide and GAN, which you know, often do not have this PN junction reverse recovery charge phenomenon. So then you know, your life is a little bit easier. Okay. So, but you can see the challenge we're, we're dealing with. These, these are typical issues I, I often do. But then another uh, issue, you know, oh, sorry, Barry. Yeah. Am I right to ask a question? Yes, yes, go ahead. Oh, not real currents. Yes. It is cur real current, actually. <laughs> yeah, it depends on how you measure it. Yes. Big, big, yes, exactly. That's, that's a good question. So again, this is something I find that's why we need to do this workshop, because there's a big gap between the academia and, and the industry. Uh, and as Barry said, normally in the academia, for you to do motor drive or motor research, you need perhaps 20 megahertz or 50 megahertz bandwidth as a good probe, right? And these probes come from you know, big companies like Tektronix and things like that. C cost lots of money. And you also you know, have limited resource in terms of um, finding to, funding to, to, to buy this equipment. And, and um, the other side of the spectrum, as we say, EMC, we, we start looking issue at megahertz level and we go beyond gigahertz. So for that, you need special tools. But, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it later with Yagi uh, about the tools you use, okay? Uh, yeah, before I forget, so apart from all these issues, there are other issues I, I often see in, in, in the field. For example, if you had a motor drive sitting at one end and then you drive a motor, say, 50 meters away or 100 meters away, then you can really run into trouble because, because not only do you have the EMI, EMC issues, you could also have a phenomenon where we can reflection, we'll call reflection. And reflection really is you are talking to an RF guy or transmission line guy, and then you will see that reflection can double the voltage on your motor winding. So that could cause problems, is it? Because you, know, you rated the voltage, say, 400 volts, and then you measure 800 volts. Lots of issues there, okay? Excuse me. Yes. Yes, that's a good question. Always, it's always best 
to design the product and see, or sort of like foresee it first, right? And then if you do have the problems, after you build the motor drive in this scenario, then you just need to do what we call troubleshooting or fix. And often that requires filters, fair rides, or change from unshielded cable to a shielded cable, things like that. Okay, mm. thanks. So what you're saying is that you can, if you don't design your facility properly, you can get reflection on the line yes. if the product yeah, yeah. meets the standard. Yes. Okay, brilliant. Thank yeah, you. There is, there is a rule, I think, on one slide where I show you at which point you really need to think about this transmission line reflection. Okay? Okay. So, yeah, I, I actually, that question fits quite well here, right? What do we do? Do we just design a system and we pray we will pass? Or do we just invest in expensive things, right? Look, this is a good example because here our engineers often have this mindset. They think, they think, if in terms of equipment or, 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 or components I use, the more expensive, the better, right? We all have this uh, thinking, like showing you here, these two common mode choke, quite expensive from well-known German manufacturer. If I can remember, one would cost about 80 to 100 pounds or euros. So just these two, it costs about $150 easily. And in fact, as you will see later on, they make things worse, not make things better. So, you know, it's not really like the more money you put into the system, it, the, the better performance it will become. So the right approach, as we said, is you need to identify the noise source, locate where it is, and then fix the problem at the source. Fix the problem at the source. Okay. So um, we talked about, you know, these challenges we're facing. So let's do a little bit demystify because if you talk to people, and then you, you mention EMC, people say, oh, it's dark art, it's black magic, or we don't understand it. So hopefully today, I know we're limited with time, but I hope this short session will at least give you, hopefully demystify some of the myths in your minds. And, and you know, I've been through a long journey to understand everything, so I hope this, this would uh, also do the job. So the, first, the world's first transmission line right, was invented by Samuel Morse hundreds of years ago, right? And it's a beautiful story behind it. So this uh, Samuel Morse himself is actually not an engineer. He's an a, a artist. And basically the story goes that he's pass, uh, his wife passed away and he felt sorry because the, the news came to him, it's too late. Then he decided to, to invent some system that can transmit message really, really quickly. So the first transmission line he came up with, extremely simple, one line over the earth and you, know, you can just use a relay chopping it at extremely low frequency. We're talking about a few hertz or tens of uh, hertz. But, but in those days, when they, they notice that, when you transmit the signals and then you get a register to, to receive the signals, you already see something like this. This not clean signals, right? We're all familiar with. If you measure your system, often you get this ringing and overshoot, ring and overshoot. Now, if I just copy this structure and then move into a modern design on a PCB, on a PCB, think about it, it's extremely similar, it's the same. You have a ground and then you run traces. So in this case, you have a FPGA which runs 10 gigahertz. Then if you just scale the math, right, you just scale the math, then you realize actually on the PCB it's just different frequency, but the principle is exactly the same. Right? So if you're doing a high frequency design or high speed design on a PCB, down to the millimeter level, you need to be careful because if you run a long trace, you will have um, reflections and overshoot. Okay, so we mentioned that uh, um, in, in the previous case, we said, ah, oh, this system is earthed or this system is grounded. People use different terms as grounded, earthed, or whatever they come up with, and it's so True, like every time I review a client's schematics, I never see a clean schematics with only one ground symbol. There are always different ground symbols, and they call it differently, right? They call it zero volts, ground, secondary ground, or whatever. You can, sometimes you find 10 ground symbols, different ones, on one design. But what is really the ground? Well, what, what is the ground? Well, if you take your product for EMC testing, and you hope your product will pass, and that ground, the only ground, is the testing ground in the EMC chamber. So here shows you a lab, 
Uh, actually, this is in Coventry. Uh, um, uh, they have a small lab doing uh, automotive tests. And uh, that shining copper plane is the test ground, meaning, meaning all the signals or voltage, whatever you measure, is referred to this ground, not anyone else, not on your PCB, not the zero volts you think, right? And, and but this, this idea of ground is also can be misleading because, for example, I travel to pretty much all the EMC test labs in the UK, and uh, you work with the EMC, especially the junior EMC test engineers, and often what they do is they always do a ground check, and the tool they use for ground check is this uh, called a milliohm meter. And this meter basically can test uh, the resistance down to milli-ohm level. But this is also misleading because, as you will see later, it's not about the resistive when you are dealing with EMC. It's always about impedance or inductance, OK? Right, this is an interesting one. So we all know now EVs, uh, EVs are all on the roads, right? EVs are all on the roads. And the key, one key component is the onboard charger. And onboard charger, what they do is the vehicle manufacturers, they often they don't make onboard chargers themselves. They buy from suppliers like Lyra, for example. So suppliers do an onboard charger design and they test it according to the component EMC standards. Okay, this is the component EMC standards. And watch, if you look at it, the, if you just follow the test setup, and then you will find, we just discussed this. Ground is reference to the test ground plane, right? So you can see the onboard charger is bonded electrically to the test ground plane. Same, same with the listen that pick up the noise, also directly bonded to the test ground plane. And often you pass, often you pass, okay? So at this time, if you are the manufacturer, you say, okay, we pass EMC, we pass all the other tests, environment or whatever, let's pass it to the manufacturer. Okay, so in this case, same onboard charger that just passed EMC with perhaps 3 dB margin, let's call it, is now installed in a vehicle. All of a sudden, things changed. What changed? Well, look at the new test based on a vehicle. Obviously, the vehicle has a vehicle chassis, which is close to the test ground plane. But the vehicle chassis is not directly bonded to the test ground plane, isn't it? has wheels, and wheels is not conducting. So all of a sudden, the same onboard charger that just passed EMC test failed. And we've seen this consistently in EMC test lab. And in fact, um, one of the big test labs, uh, their engineers told me that one day they did a really good exercise. They took a, a vehicle that failed this uh, onboard charge test, and then they really just ground it, you know, ground the vehicle to the earth, and it passed. So that shows you the power of this grounding, and you need to design a system to the right ground, okay? Now, I, when I was a student in Newcastle, I, I, I did my uh, motor drive and, 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 and uh, converter design. So at the time I was a student, I tried to understand what is a high frequency noise, common mode, differential mode, all sorts. But I, it took me a long, long time to understand it, because you know, we all fall for the trap, because at the time, I, I, I believe that current flows inside the conductor, flows in the wire. So that obviously is wrong. So in order to really understand what's been going on, you need to understand what we call the return current, return current path. So let's just look at this very simple example. You have a source. This source could be your uh, a microcontroller or a motor driver or whatever. And then you connect it to another device. It could be a load, right? Things like that, very easy. So in this case, I'm simplifying everything. So there's a ground plane, which is green on the PCB. Then on top layer, I run a signal source to a load. And I just apply a step function. I just apply a step function. So what happens? What happens? As we all know, the step function has the most important thing is how fast it, it comes from zero volts to, say, five volts in this case. And we said that switching time is more important than switching frequency. So suppose you just switch it on like that. What happens next is you have what we call a wavefront. A wavefront really is a representative of a voltage, right? And if you look at the shape of a wavefront, it's the same as a voltage, step-up voltage. So the wavefront will always follow 
the rules of nature, of physics, which means a wavefront cannot travel at infinite speeds. It has to travel within the speed of light. And on the PCB, this speed often is half of the speed of the light, okay? So you launch a wavefront, and the wavefront, the front bit, that change really represents how fast you step this voltage, how fast you step this voltage. So here we go, we step a voltage, we have a wavefront, that edge represents the voltage. And then, as a result, according to James Maxwell, you will have a current. And this current really is just trailing behind this wavefront. It's not gonna be the uh, case that the current were leading the wavefront. It's always trailing behind. So what happened is you switch it on in this particular time. Your wavefront arrives at this location on the PCB and then you have current induced behind it. But we also know that current needs to flow in a loop, right? Because otherwise then the universe will, will be turned upside down. So where is that return current? Where is that return current? Well, it took, it took human beings a long time to figure out. It's eventually, it's the James Maxwell, the great James Maxwell. He came up with this idea called displacement current, displacement current. And it just beautifully closed the loop, as, as we demonstrate here. So you got a current closed loop. And if you look at the current, that um, current, oh, this. And you will see the current really, you can work it out. The I equals C dV over dt. We have a dV over dt, which is the wave front, and we also have a capacitor. Of course we have a capacitor because the wire is, you know, is, is uh, over the PCB uh, ground, so you always have some capacitors. So that makes sense, that makes sense. So if we understand this, if we understand this, now we have a look at the next stage. Next stage, wave front moving forward, again, current induced, and then you have to close the loop. And then in the end, by the time it hits the load, we have a perfect continuous current loop. But the point is, it takes time, it takes, in this case, six steps to arrive at the load. It's not as we thought, the current goes this way and then return. It's not like that, it's not like that. Okay, so if you understand this, then it's a little bit easier now for you to understand all EMC phenomena. For example, if you understand this, you probably wouldn't do something like this. So in this case, you know, you think, ah, yeah, it's all right, we have a gap or break on the ground. It's all right, isn't it? Well, not so. I mean, if it's a DC, it's, of course it's okay, because DC doesn't really matter. You will just take whatever time, and you're not switching. But once you have a high-frequency event, you don't want to have a break, because once you have a break, you can see the current will take a long loop to finish the, loop, uh, the, the return. And that long loop, in the electronics engineer's term, is inductance, is inductance. Now look at the second case. This, I think everybody does this, right? We have a, a shielded cable, yeah, well, we connect it, and what will we do with the shield? Well, you know, leave it there, it's a shielded cable. Not, not the case, not the case. If you look at it, if you have a shielded cable with a shield unterminated or terminated wrong, what happens is, all of a sudden, because we mentioned about this uh, return current, you have to have a return current. So inside the shields, it's fine. You have a forward current, the, the, the return current is always inside the shield, and you, you have a field. But then, once the center conductor extends outside of the shield, you have a problem, because you need to still have a return current, and that return current all of a sudden is induced on the outer surface of a shield. So now you have surface current flowing outside of the shield, and this could be a big problem because the shield often has big resistance and also uh, inductance. So it can radiate and cause lots of problems. Another case where we have wires penetrate through the enclosure. So inside enclosure, everything is shielded, fine. Then you have wires, not shielded wires, getting out of the system and you connect it to another system. As a result, your, your, your forward current goes out, where's the return current? Well, you started to induce in current, surface current again, on the surface of the enclosure. So these could all cause problems and these are often the source for the, uh, for the uh, EMC for the EMI issues. So here I list a few common, commonly seen issues that are often related to ground. So as we mentioned, right, so one 
phenomenon we often discuss in the EMIMC society is the balloon effect, meaning you try to suppress noise at certain frequency. Yes, you suppress it, but then in a higher frequency, something pop up again. So almost as if you are trying to, uh, you know, push a blue down and then the other one is uh, coming up. Okay. So here I initially, uh, for today's session, I wanted to bring some uh, interesting demonstration tools so you can see it. But unfortunately, we, uh, we're running out of time and uh, you know, uh, taking things is, is, uh, is a quite a, a difficult task. So I prepare some uh, video that you can watch, but I'm just also conscious about time. So we have 40 minutes wrong already? I yeah. think so, yeah. yeah. Maybe, well, if we have time, we'll watch this later, yeah. yeah. So this presentation, uh, this demonstration I did shows you how to measure the surface current we just discussed. But uh, I'll just skip for now, and if we have time, I will we'll show you. Okay, so to close this ground discussion, I'll show you some interesting example, right? we all seen this, but we just never realize it. So the first example I want to show is a Tom Tom sat nav, you know, in the past we all used Tom Tom sat nav. And if you open it up, then you will find some designs. Now you look at it and then it makes that all start making sense because, for example, on the back of the screen, there is a conductive continuous plate. And this is really like a ground. But then, of course, you have multiple PCBs. You have a PCB here and, and there. So how are you going to join two PCBs ground together? Well, if you're just using a wire connection, that's a not good uh, connection because a wire itself is inductance. That tiny wire, when it comes to 10 megahertz, 100 megahertz, becomes a very high impedance uh, joint. So what you do, what you do is you join two grounds at multiple points, as demonstrated in this design, right? So when this side of the PCB is uh, in close contact with the uh, the ground of the, the screen, you can see the shield of the PCB is connected to this side. But what is more interesting is on this side. So if you look at this side, you will notice there are little um, copper, and we call it uh, copper spring fingers, right? They're about five or six at different locations. And I tell you, they're all connected to the ground layer of the PCB. And what you do is, when you close the plastic to this PCB, you can see interesting thing is, embedded in this plastic housing, there is a mesh, which is also conductive. So now, you really have three grounds, and they are all connected via multiple connection points. And that's the best to join different boards together. You don't want to join grounds at one point. So here shows you a, a troubleshooting skill I often use in, in a large system where if I believe the issue is caused by different grounds, what I often do as a quick and dirty uh, way, uh, you know, our German colleagues often call it quick and dirty approach, is um, I tape it using copper tape. And you may think copper tape, that thing, and it's not even, some part is not conductive. But it's fine because as we demonstrated in the previous case, when it comes to high frequency, these signals or noise, whatever you call it, they travel on the surface, isn't it? They, they are not traveling inside the conductor. So as long as I have a really good conductivity on the surface, I'm good with high frequency signal, right? So yeah, and uh, there's another case study, I think, Yegi, you probably uh, want to talk. That's, uh, that's the project we worked on. So. Oh yeah, so that's the um, control board of the DC-DC converter. Uh, from Lyra that we worked on. As Min just explained, what we had was we had a break in the ground, uh, which was causing us uh, issues. If you see on the uh, top right on the graph, the yellowish, greenish uh, trace, that's where it, how it looked like before we uh, managed to fix the problem. So in order to tackle this, we, um, if you look on the bottom, you can see that uh, how we connected the grounds together using multiple caps, capacitors, and we saw that the uh, emissions got much better if you look at the top, um, the pinky trace. Uh, so uh, it made huge improvements. And then we decided in the end, for the actual product, we just used one solid ground, connected them all together, and then fixed our EMC problem in that uh, product. So yeah, that was quite interesting, actually. OK. Thanks, Yiki. Um, yeah, so you know, my, part of my job is to work with clients 
And uh, sometimes if I work with other companies, if, especially if they have some good engineers, but you know, um, they started working uh, back in the 80s and 90s, they all have their rule of thumb. And some of the rule of thumb are just not true in today's uh, design, you know, with all this FPGA and high-speed design. It's quite hard to convince them that, look, one ground is always better than separate grounds and connecting use ferrite or whatever together. Um, but it takes time, it takes time. Once they see the effect, as, as we demonstrated in the pre previous slides, they will, they will buy into the idea. Okay, so that's all the discussion with grounds. Of course, if, if I want, I can spend just half a day talking about, about ground, but obviously we don't have the luxury. Um, but as, as I said, feel free to, to find me after this session. I'm happy to answer all your um, noise or EMC-related questions. So the next subject I wanted to talk, and is particularly interesting for those people who design uh, power and motor drive, is coupling, coupling and uh, parasitics. So, when we talk about coupling, there are generally speaking uh, four types of coupling. The first is conductive coupling, as we said. Conductive coupling is easy to understand. You just connect two uh, equipment or devices using a wire. And uh, it could be power, it could be uh, Ethernet, it could be USB, HDMI, it could be anything. As long as the energy is using this wire connection to travel between the two, you have a conducted coupling, easy to understand. The next one is what we call near field coupling. Now this is interesting because, for example, this source could be a computer, and this, the, 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 uh, the wire on, on the bottom could be just a mains power line. And then, then your victim is another PC, but this is actually not a mains wire, it's a, let's say USB. But the minute they are getting close together, then they couple, they couple, even though one is power, one is signal, okay? And we're gonna spend uh, more time talking about near field coupling than the rest. Now the next one, oh, uh, then there's also the radiated coupling. This is something we're all familiar with. This is the uh, time when we use phones, you know, like the uh, uh, walkie-talkie, where you have a walkie-talkie, you have a little antenna, and then your friend has another walkie-talkie, and you can talk within one kilometer distance. That's pretty much it, right? That's your, your antenna coupling. So today we're only spending time on near-field coupling and try to understand why for motor drive and power application is important. So this is the magnetic field coupling, right? And we all know magnetic field forms as, as a field if you have current loop. So this, this field, and again, this is interesting because again, we're talking about energy in the space because field is actually stored in the space. So if you store energy in the space and then you have a PCB nearby and then you have a, you know, a, ribbon cable connection, then of course, according to you know, the physics, you will start to introduce current flowing between the two balls, and this is induced current. And, and we also know any cable, if there's current travel on the cable structure, this cable becomes a antenna, becomes an antenna. So this is a typical uh, uh, magnetic coupling mechanism, okay? Or you can call it uh, inductive coupling because as we said, it's all induction. Yeah? And uh, one thing about um, inductive coupling is that because, because the, the two wires or cables next to each other, they almost perfectly form what we call a current transformer. So it's interesting. So for example, in this case, if my a source wire, let's say, is, is a wire one, and the current goes this way, then you can work out the voltage polarity of, of, of the induced voltage on wire one. And then, of course, it's a you know, one-to-one -one current transformer, then you will start to induce voltage on line two. And then the interesting part is on line two, the voltage polarity is as shown here. It's this direction. That means, if you forget about the capacitive coupling, just focusing on the inductive coupling, then you have a loop, loop current. Right? You have a loop current going one direction, forming a current loop. So you can, based on this, you can actually calculate the voltage that induced on the load, and then this is really your interference voltage caused by inductive coupling. But of course, 
you cannot have an ideal scenario where you only have inductive coupling, right? You will have some capacitive coupling, right? So capacitive coupling is even easier because as we said, two conductor or surface or whatever, in between if you are sandwiched with an insulation layer, you have a natural capacitance. So such as in this case. So you can see the chip on the PCB will have a parasitic capacitance to the wire. And of course, there will be high frequency current flowing through this parasitic capacitance, and again, this cable becomes an antenna, right? Same phenomenon, okay? But the difference between the inductive and the cap capacitive coupling really is, remember when we say the inductive coupling, you got an ideal, almost an ideal current transformer, and then uh, the induced voltage has the same polarity as the other one, so you have current flowing as one direction in a, in a loop. Whereas in this case, it's almost as, as if you inject a noise via a capacitor. So the current will get into the victim line. And at this point, what does the current do? It will split, right? It will split. There's no one direction. So here, we have current going both ways. And, and, uh, and again, you know, simple math, you can work out the voltage induced on the load, um, load resistor in this case. Now, I don't want to get into detail. If you talk to uh, what we call signal and power integri integrity guy, then he or she will be continue talking about what we call near and crosstalk and far end crosstalk. Because as you can see, you can never have a pure uh, inductive or capacitive coupling. So as a result, you've got some uh, current going this way at certain frequency, but then you've got some current flowing this way at different frequency, then you, 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 you constructively add them together or destructively uh, add them together. It's, it's uh, too much, I think. Okay. Now. Understanding this is important because now if we look at a machine, if we look at a machine, a motor, now we can easily spot the parasitic component in a machine design, right? So for example, we mentioned the bearing has capacitance. Looking there, the metal frame and the chassis ground, depends on how you connect it, has capacitance, right? It will be sitting on the, on the, on the ground and you got uh, windings depends on how you wind your machine. You will have different interwinding capacitance, right? I mean, I'm not an expert in how to wind a machine, but I know uh, some people there are really the true master of that. But again, depends on how you do the configuration. You have uh, different interwinding capacitance. Cables, we mentioned cables, different lengths will have different resonant frequency, right? And uh, and now moving to the drive side. On the drive side you have parasitic capacitance because of the package, right? You also have lead inductance, depends on the package. For example, a typical case is a, if you're using a silicon carbide device, TO247 with long leads, that's long inductance, uh, large inductance, whereas, for example, if you are uh, using ST pack, then you know, it's smaller inductance. And, and, and we'll demonstrate with this inductance and the capacitance of a uh, uh, power electronic devices, you will create ringing and overshoots. So uh, all, all this. Is it my turn? No, I'm just saying oh, if you. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think we've got a qu okay. question, guys. We're happy to answer it. We've got a question. All right. Um, for that example you had there, yeah. was the chassis ground on a dirty earth and the power electronics put on a clean earth? So normally when we design facilities, we have different yeah. earth bars. Yes. So those would be on different earth bars and then joined together far away. Yeah, I understand your question. Again, I like your question because dirty and clean ground, again, is a, is a um, term that we, I often see when I visit clients. So in your application, I would never call any ground as a dirty or clean, right? As we explained, it's one ground. You just need to work out, you just need to work out. In the system, for example, like this, with drive, cable, and the motor, when you born the system in, a, in, a, in an environment, trying to keep the loop size, look at the loop. So in this case, I would look, focus on the loop between the drive and the motor and the cable. As long as in this loop, the ground is continuous, you're almost fine, however, as you said, if your chassis ground is bonded to a dirty or clean ground, whereas your motor drive is via heat sink bonded to another ground, and 
remember the conversation we had between these two grounds. You could have gap or break or whatever in between. That's a high impedance path. So all of a sudden, you create a big loop with lots of noise there. And chances are the system will radiate a lot. And also, think about this dirty ground, as you, you pointed out. In a motor drive application, not only do you need to worry about high frequency noise, you, sometimes you also need to worry about uh, low frequency noise. So for example, if you have other motor drives in the same environment, create extremely low, volt, uh, low frequency phenomena like kilohertz. And the kilohertz noise, they, they spread because they are low frequency. It's not like high frequency, they always keep, you know, as we demonstrated, keep to the ground. Low frequency like DC, they spread everywhere. So you have to be careful. If it's very low frequency, then really you, you create problems. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. No problem. Okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah, well, this is pretty much what we just discussed, right? This is pretty much what we just discussed. So, before I hand um, the mic to Yegi, another important concept I want to demonstrate today is common mode noise, right? We, as engineers, junior or university, uh, whatever level engineers, we pretty much understand differential mode. Differential mode is easy. Differential mode is easy. But the common mode, as we've seen this drawing over papers and papers and papers on IEEE papers, if you look at any subject related to EMC, EMI, and common mode, this you will always see. But for a long time, I was struggling. I was struggling to understand why. You know, why do people draw like something like this? And, and, and really, uh, you know, we are human beings. If we can't see it, we don't seem to trust the fully, right? Seeing is believing, seeing is believing. So when I started the business, I, I often tried to explain things, but I also wanted to show people, like, look, this is really what you can see, and now you believe me. Okay, so to demonstrate this common modes, let's first understand a very simple um, concept. Um, I'm using a very simple design, right? This is a design we see every day in our daily life. You have mains voltage comes in, connected to a charger. So this is your GAN-driven, um, say, phone charger or a laptop charger, 65 watts or 130 watts, whatever the uh, power rating is, often use a um, you know, active uh, clamp uh, flyback in this case, okay? Simple circuit, you got 230 volts in, 400 volts on DC link, and then you have um, 12 volts to drive, a, well, 12 or 24, whatever volts to charge or, or LED, whatever. Okay, simple circuit. If I really want to understand things in a very simple manner, I use the field view. So I treat everything as a field. So I know energy is a form of field, electric magnetic field. So really, if you look at the energy flow, I want to move energy from where the energy is stored, which in this case from the the mains network, and I move, move, move to the consumer side. So when I move the energy, if everything happens like a click, no boundary, that's perfect, that's perfect. But it's not the case, it's not the case. So when you move energy from one side to the other, first you have to store this energy. So in this case, the first energy storage device is often the electrolytic capacitor on the DC link side. So energy actually moving from here and stored in the, in the big electrolytic capacitor. And next, next, since this is a, this is a, a flyback converter, then you know, the inductor is not really like, or the transformer is not like a transformer, it's more like an inductor, okay? So the next is the energy then is moved to the air gap in the transformer. And what happens next is then this energy will be dumped into the load. And you've got devices there, right? So from the electrolytic capacitor to the transformer, you have your silica carbide or GAN. And then from the transformer to the load, you have your silica carbide diode. That's often the case now. So you see it takes steps. And we all know when it takes steps, it delays. It takes steps and delays. And this is the main problem to create a common mode noise. So, the yellow trace here shows you all the energy between the wires, between your live and neutral. Easy to understand, right? Now what happens is, because you are requiring energy in a extreme demand, when I say extreme demand means you want the energy to be delivered extremely fast. Because, why, why I'm saying that? Because you are using fast switches, right? Those two devices are 
switching really fast. So we know this energy takes time to be delivered to the final user. So what happens next? What happens is there will be energy, there will be energy delivered not using the live and neutral wire, but using something like you know, uh, live neutral and earth, because energy travels in space. So what we're saying is, if you demand energy in a fast rate, and the main circuit cannot meet that demand, what happens naturally is whatever surrounds the unit will provide the energy. But then you may ask why there is uh, energy surrounding it. Well, we said that this all energy is in the field, and field is in the space. So I can also simplify things using what we understand using a circuit view. Okay, so. If I deliver energy as a differential mode, I create differential mode noise. So that's the little loop there, we all understand. Yeah? And then, of course, you get differential mode everywhere. So that basically represents the main energy source, traveling from the main source to the load. Everything is easy. Now, we also said there will be surrounding structures to provide you energy. And these, basically, are going through this way. And all the energy near this circuit is stored in the space. And that space between the unit and the Earth, there will be parasitic capacitance. And we know parasitic capacitance stores energy. Tiny, tiny energy. I mean, generally speaking, you have 50, 100 picofarad capacitance between the circuit and the ground. But still, that's 100 picofarad capacitor. Do the mass, 1 over 2 CV square. You can calculate the energy stored in that parasitic capacitance. So, as we said, if you're delivering energy in a really fast rate, and you cannot meet this within the two lines you're supplying power, there will be energy delivered from all these parasitic capacitors. And as a result, these capacitors start to charge, discharge, charge, discharge. Now we form a perfect common mode loop. So as demonstrated in this red uh, arrow, OK? So now. You see, you got common mode, you got differential mode, but you probably still don't believe me. You said, this is just bullshit. I, I can't see it, I, I, I don't believe you. Okay, how can we see it? How can we see it? Again, I designed this interesting case, right? So here you can see it's a battery on the left. It's a 12 volts battery, and I'm connected to a 12 volts to 5 volts DC-DC step-down converter. Extremely simple. And you can see I have two or three devices here, but I want you to only focus on the two there. So one is a donut-shaped radio frequency monitor probe, as we just explained. This probe often has a bandwidth up to a gigahertz. So in my case, it works all the way up to a gigahertz, high bandwidth radio frequency probe. And what I'm holding is a half donut-shaped probe. And this is essentially the same as the RF current probe, but designed to measure surface current, designed to measure surface current. Okay, so as you can see, the wires is supported on this insulation support. You got a um, test ground plane there, right? And we explained, if you have common mode noise, you're gonna have current going this way and then return on the surface of the test ground plane. So how am I gonna test it? Well, I have current probe measuring on the wire, and then I'm gonna use the half donor-shaped uh, surface current probe to measure current on the test ground plane. And if I'm correct, if I'm correct, these two currents should be more or less the same amplitude and different phase, different phase, because one goes this direction and then the other goes the other direction. So we have two traces showing you here. One on top is the uh, uh, measurement on the wire and the one on the bottom is the trace measurement on the surface. So if I zoom in, if I zoom in, and what you can see, right? Pretty much same, same amplitude, but different phase, different phase. Meaning what we explained was correct, right? You got common mode traveling on both wires and with one direction, returning on the surface, returning on the surface. So that's how I, how I see the common mode current. Okay, and last thing before I hand it to Yegi is um, you can also measure it in a very large system, okay? So here you can see I'm, I was working, safety boots, boots on, vehicle is being charged, it's a big vehicle, and I just made this self-made, homemade resistive probe. And if you know what you do, then you know this probe actually works up to uh, 500 or 600 megahertz at least in terms of the bandwidth. But in this case, I'm measuring the low frequency common mode noise as I explained to you. 
So that's a chassis plate in the vehicle. As you said, it's a, it should be a clean, it should be a clean ground. Is it clean? Well, during the vehicle running stage, it is clean, but not in the charging stage, as we said. So during charging, this is the time when I'm poking the current, uh, the, the self-made, homemade resistor probe to the chassis, just measuring the surface current, and look at it. I'm starting from nine kilohertz, and we start from minus 10 dB microvolts. When the onboard charger is switched on, we get 30 dB microvolts measured. So that's 40 dB higher. What does that mean in, in the electrical sense? 40 dB higher is you measure the noise 100 times more, 100 times more. It's crazy, isn't it? Okay. And oh yeah, one, one final sl uh, slide. So yeah, so we, we talked about grounding, we talked about um, parasitics and coupling. Now let's look at a typical EMI design for a GAN device a charger as we just uh, used. So again, same example is a GAN device charger, 65 watts. If you open up any charger in the market that claims to pass the EMC, some, some claims, but they fail, but some uh, good quality ones definitely pass, then you will always see very similar uh, design approach when it comes to addressing all these EMC, EMI challenges. First, if you look at the transformer, you will find often they have this uh, almost like a copper tape, tape around our transformer, and this copper tape doesn't need to be grounded. And what it does, what it does really is just, it, it, you, when you have a high frequency field in a transformer, you induce eddy current. And then you induce eddy current on this uh, flux band, and it creates another magnetic field that happens to cancel out whatever you created. So that's, that's all, all it does. It works, does not need to be grounded, surprisingly, okay? What else? Well, they often have multi-stage filter, and often it's two-stage filter, because of course, of course you can do three-stage, but two-stage is a good balance between cost and performance. And if you look at the first stage, it's always either an inductor or a common mode choke with many terms, gives you good inductance, or use flat wire winding so you can take a lot of current. But this has its limitation, as we all know now, right? The limitation of this, of such common mode choke, really, is when you get the turn to turn so close and so many number of turns, you start to have lots of capacitance, interwinding capacitance. And in high frequency, these interwinding capacitance becomes a short circuit for high frequency noise. So what do you do? Well, you add another common mode choke. But look at the design between this common mode choke and the other common mode choke. Very different, isn't it? So the second stage common mode choke, first thing we notice is only using four or five, num four, four or five terms, right? Maximum six, maybe. And they also wind differently. So the first case is what we call sectional winding. And the second case is bifilar winding. So one works in low frequency, one works in high frequency. But of course, the high frequency one does not give you enough uh, inductance, but it works at high frequency because high frequency, your noise level is not as high as the low frequency. And finally, we'll look at the shield. Well, shield needs to be grounded in this case, right? We we'll talked about the shield on the transformer, and I said that does not need to be grounded necessarily, not necessarily. But if you're using a shield overall of a product, you need to ground it. Now comes the point. Well, where do we ground it? Because in this system, we have two grounds, isn't it? We have, let's say, zero volt secondary, that's on the low voltage safe side, but also you've got HV minus related, that's the rectified stage. Dangerous stuff, right? You don't want to touch it. So how are we gonna ground this shield on two sides? Because you don't want just to ground on one side. Well, a trick is you ground it to the low voltage side directly, because that's safe to do, but to the high voltage side, you use a small capacitance, small capacitance. Okay? Uh, yeah, okay, Yegi. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're, we're good with time, so. Yeah. Just go and stand there. Okay, so, yeah, so I'm gonna start talking about the bench testing of the uh, Lyra's four kilowatt DC-DC converter. So uh, this is a bi-directional um, 
dual active bridge converter, we um, have got 800, we've got four variants of this product. Either we will have 800 or 400 on the high voltage side, or 12 or 24 volts on the low voltage side. So uh, the low voltage side is quite high current, so around 300 amps for the 12 volt version. And um, our customer wanted this to be tested as per CISPR 25 standard, which you need to pass, as I said before, conducted emissions and radiated emission tests. Um, something we found when we started testing with MIN as well, something I, I want to mention here again is that you need to think about EMI at the beginning. So we learned this the hard way at Lyra, so it was quite challenging to get this to work. But in our next product, we've managed to think ahead and then it's just sailing through nice and easy. So it's quite important to think about it in the beginning. So as you can see in the graph below, that's where you, the frequencies that you need to measure and test your product as for conducted emissions and radiated emission tests, and then for radiated emission, you need to use different types of antenna for, depending on what frequency you're trying to test at. And then you also need to position them vertically and horizontally in front of your product. I'm gonna show you uh, how it's done here. Oh, but before doing that, uh, there are two different methods that you can use for conducted emission tests. Depending on your OEM, they might want you to test only based on voltage testing using lizens or current probe or both. So you need to check with your OEM and look at their requirements. But um, the current probe method and voltage method, if you, if you look on the table on the top, um, you can see they, uh, that for CISPR 25 class 5, the limits are set for different frequency bands. For example, um, it starts from 150 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz and so on. But the voltage method has got its own limits, but then the column on the right hand side is how the uh, dB microamp from current probe measurement is converted to voltage um, method, so you can just use both of them to do the same thing in your lab if you want to just get some confidence for your pre-compliance test. Something that's quite important is the limit that is shown in here. I think this is the, is, it, is that a class five limit? I think it's a class five, yeah. So class five limit, you can see the black uh, limit is the average, the pink one is quasi-peak, and then the red one is the peak level for class five. So no matter what your device is, if it's 48 to 12 volt DC DC with low power, let's say 800 watts, you need to pass this limit, which it's, you can see on the, on the right hand side, it says that you need to have ma maximum 159 nanoamps. If you increase your uh, device power and the voltage, you still need to, sit, to uh, comply with the same amount of um, current. And if you go even higher to, like for example, motor drive with 250 kilowatts, again, the same test limit applies to you. So as you can see how challenging it gets as you keep going up in voltage and current, your problem gets much harder, but the limit stays the same. Okay, so uh, this is the conducted emission test setup that we've done, got at Lyra. So we're planning on having our own, our own EMC chamber for pre-compliance tests, um, which we'll have it in the, in the new year. Uh, but this is what we had last year when I was testing the a DC DC converter at Lyra just to get it to um, ready before going to the test house. As you can see, um, I set up the test similar to what the uh, CISPR 25 conducted emission test setup asks you to, to do. So you will have the, your device on a low relative permittivity material like those uh, blue foamy things that needs to be um, five centimeter thick. Uh, the standard tells you how long the cables have to be, where you should place them, what lessons you need to use. Our customer wanted us to test this locally grounded. Um, the, so the ground, as you can see, is locally grounded. And you, those, that cable that's connected to the ground plane. Uh, so basically, I've uh, put, placed the test in Lyra, similar to that. And there are two lessons on the right-hand side, which you cannot see here. But that's measuring the low voltage, 12 volt line as well. The battery is on the bottom of the bench. The ground plane is on the bench. There are three lessons, uh, one kV, one of them is 1 kV, 500 amps. The other one is, I think, 1,000 amps, and the load as well. So what uh, I got here was, uh, when I did the test and I was ready to go to the actual test house, was really similar to what we saw in the test house. So if you uh, set it up correctly, it will be very close to what you'll see in real uh, test scenarios. And now this is the radiated emission test setup. So similar to conducted emissions, it actually the standard tells you how you have to set it up. The unit has to be grounded to the ground plane. The antenna needs to pla be placed at a certain distance from the 
cables, the cables, high voltage and low voltage line have to be uh, lying next to each other flat in front of the uh, antenna. I think the antenna has to be around one meter away from the certain of the cable bundle and everything has to be, uh, the lesions, the unit, all have to be referenced to the ground plane and you need to place the antenna vertically and horizontally as I said before and then you will change it depending on what frequency you need to test that. Okay, so uh, using lesions you can measure um, the noise as I've said before but uh, there is no way that you can separate conducted uh, common mode and differential mode noise using the lesion. Uh, but there is a device, a, DC, a common mode and differential mode discrimination network that you can, be, you can place it between your lesion and your spectrum analyzer that will allow you to actually separate these uh, noise because um, it's quite a useful uh, tool actually when you're trying to troubleshoot to know if you might know it's more differential or more common mode or what, what is it. Um, uh, as you can see on that graph, um, I'm showing the lesion measurement and also the common mode and differential mode measurement using this discrimination network. So that's very useful to use. Also, as I said before, current probe measurement is also very useful when you um, want to look at your emissions. For example, if you, have, if you have want to test in the lab before going to the test house, uh, there's, but there's something that you need to take, think about is that the, com the current probe measurement results and lesion results are very similar below five megahertz, but what I found out is that after five megahertz, as I'm showing there, there's some differences between them. Um, so uh, the, the blue line, uh, the blue trace on the bottom is the current probe measurement, which is the average line, and it has to be below that red trace, red limit trace. Um, so if you just rely on the current probe and don't know about what I'm going to tell you now, you just go to the test house expecting to pass, but then actually, when you, the test is done on a lesion measurement, you'll fail. So um, on the standard, it tells you, you need to place the current probe at a certain location because certain harmonics get uh, coupled differently at different locations. So you need, I think in a standard, they tell you to place it 50, centi 50 millimeter and 750 millimeters away from the, um, the device. So that needs to be taken care of. And also the current probe, the diameter, the aperture of the current probe is also very important. You need, the smaller it is, the better you, it will be coupled, but then you need to find out for the frequency that you want to look at what aperture of the current probe you need to use. So that's quite important before going to the test houses when you're just testing your component in the lab. But I guess we can take some questions. Yeah, so far, questions. if there's any question, just it's the best time to shoot. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Sorry, I'll, I'll start that again. There's a lot of software vendors that um, sell finite element analysis tools to, to try to design these upfront, right, rather than waiting to go to the lab to verify, you know, pre-compliance or whatever. Uh, wh what is your opinion about those tools? You know, wh what do you need in your teams to be able to enable using those tools to, to accelerate your development and make sure you get EMI right? Yeah, should I answer this? Yeah. Is it, you mean the software will simulate the, the Yeah, so you, you, you get so, software packages like Mentor Graphics or even ANSYS, they have um, electromagnetic uh, finite element simulators, right? So, and you can put your PCB, you can put your sources and your victims and uh, transmission lines and you get a 3D spec, you know, 3D plot of how, how the noise is. I, I've always struggled with those tools because mm -hmm. it, it looks like you need to put a lot of effort exactly. into it in the yeah. first place and maybe you're better off just using good practice and then having some pre-compliance in your labs. I wanted to gauge your opinion about whether, whether it's useful to have those tools and if you do decide to have the tools, what sort of people do you need to be able to run those tools? Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. I mean, um, from my, just my consulting side of things, pretty much all the companies are designing these tools. <laughs> they are, they are in, 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 in touch with me, as you can imagine. So they want me to help them develop the tools because currently it's still very challenging mm. to make the software really show the results you can measure. Mm. Now, the biggest problem is if you speak to a test house, right, chamber A, chamber B, in the same test house, two chambers, all characterize and all you know pass the um, uh, whatever the certificate they, they need. 
you will find different results. Yes. So for conductive emission, the difference is actually you can con control because it's quite low frequency compared to radiated emission. The trouble is when you test something in a radiated emission in, in a, an echoic chamber, starting from say 30 megahertz all the way to now six gigahertz, the difference between the two chambers can sometimes be up to 6 dB. And 6 dB really can be a pass or fail. So if measurement cannot guarantee a consistent result, how can we make sure that our simulation model do the same? So I think at this stage development, I think to do conducting emission simulation with really good understanding of the system, as you said, particularly the parasitics as we explained today, you can build a good even SPICE model. You don't need fancy stuff, you know. You, you can build a SPICE model, taking these parasitic capacitance in, you can, you can close the common modes loop, you can have a really good prediction of, of the common mode um, current. But that's it. When it comes to high frequency, extremely difficult. But that's not to say these softwares don't have a marketplace. For example, the biggest one called uh, CST Studio, uh, one of their presenters presented it, uh, this year as well. Yes. Um, the, uh, Jaguar Land Rover, Rolls Royce, all these BAE, they use it. I mean, it's a, such a big system. You need to do some simulation before you, yeah. before you yeah. Simulation is a big issue in this field. And then the available software, mm. you can't simulate all these things. Uh, on the PCB, currently, um, you, there are uh, different tools. There's often, you know, if, especially if you're doing PCB layout work, then uh, you can use what they call checker. It's, it's based on rules. So you, you basically give the uh, software your, your Gerber file, then they basically read everything, and then they tells you, okay, for example, here you have a, a, a break in the ground plane, and then they will analyze if there's any signal lying on the next layer. If so, then they will say, look, this is wrong. So that's the current status all these software can do. But there is, I know there's a new company based in Spain. They're trying to use artificial intelligence, of course, is a hot topic. So maybe yeah. by training all these software, when they read so many wrong PCB designs in terms of signal and power integrity and EMC, hopefully they can self-train and then correct all the mistakes. Well, it's, a, it's a space to watch, yeah. Do you have to specify on the simulation which track is high, which has high, high can, speed? Can, oh, yes. Yeah, that's another issue. Yeah. Yeah, you have to tell the tell software them, which so line is which. Yeah. Lots of time yeah. uh, consumed. Exactly. Yeah. And as I said, we're, we're here for the two days, so if you have any yeah. questions, just feel free. And, and, and uh, also, I think it's worth mentioning that this year, uh, I think biggest the problem with, you know, people have misconception of EMC particularly in the UK, is that we don't have good universities that teach this course. So, so since, um, since this year, I have been teaching some of the universities. I mean, it's, it's half a day or one day course, um, but really just trying to give the students a, an idea, right? Uh, so that they don't make this mistakes when they, when they go to the working environment. I mean, lies. all the companies I work with, they all have the MC. Can you start from here? Yeah, but, okay, the problem is in your point. Mm. So, can I, give, can I give you my, can I give you my pen? York, yes. York is the only uh, university doing EMC teaching. Um, and also, there is uh, a close, close to Leicester, there is uh, De Montfort, I think. Alistair Duffy is the professor there teaching um, uh, uh, courses. Uh, but I would say the biggest the gap really is if you want to teach EMC as a subject, then inevitably you need to talk, you know, teach transmission line reflections, all these characteristics, things like that. They often scare students off, whereas if you look at the job I do every day, you don't need to understand complex math. It's, it's more understanding of the physics and knows what tools to apply to fix these issues. So I think that's the gap we're trying to fill in here, like today. We are never, we're not using any uh, equations. We're not explaining you know, um, the, the, the Maxwell equations, that's four, four equations, um, but rather just really looking from the product design side of things. I mean, Yegi has been working for Lyra for many years. I, before I started this business, I worked for Dyson Technology, their design company, so I worked 
many years on the design side of things as well. So I know the challenges we're facing. And also, you know, what we didn't mention is it also depends on the application side of things. So for example, all the subjects we're talking today, if you look at application, they're more home appliance, industrial, or uh, automotive. So these, we, we, uh, we, we, we put them in the volume manufacturing side. So with ma uh, volume ma manufacturing, you need really to understand everything because each component you add, you, you need to understand whether it will work as we, we talk, right? Sometimes it don't work or when you add it, what's the weight, what's the size, what's the cost, you know, because everything like automotive, you make 100,000 a year, that costs lots of money. So you have to take all this into account. But obviously, if you work with a military application, you don't really care, just throwing everything you can, you know, they don't um, make, make a big fuss about the spending in terms of future, and everything is shielded anyway. So I would say, you know, different challenges. I wouldn't say military is easy, because military, they have, more stringent uh, the limit, but but you, you can use uh, expensive stuff. So okay, we're back. Okay. Um, I skipped yeah. that slide, so yeah. it's fine. Uh, so as I said before, uh, current probe measurement and uh, lizard measurement are both very useful. You can see here is one of the uh, tests that Min's done, uh, where he shows that using the RF current probe, you can predict the far field emissions, and on, a, on the traces, you can see how the trace uh, profile looks very similar. In when he's used um, an antenna just for radiated emissions. And then the prediction that the current probe has done is pretty close to what he saw in the test chamber. Um, oh, uh, okay, so the, uh, the green trace is not actually in a chamber. It's an outside of a chamber. That's why you have these spikes on the green trace. Uh, Min? Okay. Um, so we had about 30 to 40 minutes left, I think. Yeah, so that's pretty, pretty um, good on timing. Um, so as, as Yegi demonstrated, you know, Lyra, when, when we first worked together, it was a DC-DC converter, yeah, and it's quite late stage. So we have to throw in a lot of effort just to fix the problem. And of course, now Lyra is now doing the next generation DC-DC and also doing the onboard charger design. So we take all the lessons learned then uh, we can make things a lot easier. And uh, as you can see, the, the top uh, flow really is pretty much, I would say 90% of the companies are still doing this. And the good, really, really good companies, or especially those companies who have learned their lessons through the hard way, they would definitely adopt the second approach, meaning the, you will need to review your EMC design at the concept stage, at the concept stage, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you because I know for a fact that in a, in, a, in, a, in a company I worked in the past, when you are making hundreds of thousands of products, the concept stage, you really need to highlight the EMC risk. For example, would the motor be held in the hand two meters away from the converter, or you put them together in, in one unit. What kind of impact does it have when you have a two meter long cable? Would it radiate, would it conduct it? You know, all these things you have to talk in the concept stage. Because the worst things happen is, somebody, some really good managers, they will take the concepts and then bring it to the boss and say, look, this design is great. And we have this, this, this benefit, and at this cost. If you don't let them know, if you don't raise your voice by saying, look, I don't think this design would work because you will fail the MC or you will throw in lots of money on futuring, then this idea passed to the big boss and then two years, three years down the line, then you don't want to be in that position where you have to fight the MC problems, okay? Okay? Now we talked about ringing and overshoot. So this really helps you to understand why it is bad from the EMC point of view, and also we all know from your, 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 your device selection is also not good because, for example, you design a 40 volt system, if it's uh, overshoots to 80 volts, then it's a problem, isn't it? So in this case, you can see there's a problem, and I, as I said, I just made a uh, spy space simulation. Okay, spy space simulation, I can put 20 nano Henry inductance based on my inspection of the device, which is a two, TO247 device. I put a, a few nanofarads as the parasitic capacitance of the device, and I just do a switch. And then you can see on the bottom, 
you get a overshoot if, if you have 20 nano Henry inductance in this loop. But of course, if you reduce the inductance to 10 to 5, then you reduce the overshoot and the ringing. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, so yeah, for us as design engineers, we need, first thing is DC link, second is how to reduce the ringing and overshoot. Well, there's not only, well, think, think, speaking of um, reducing inductance, well, first thing is you can select a different package. As we said, if you have TO247, you have larger inductance, but if you select some surface-mounted devices, you have smaller inductance. And of course, you have to do a really good layout job on the PCB. Um, but there are other things you can do, right? You can use a snubber circuit. We all know how it works. Uh, you can use zero voltage switching scheme, but then bear in mind, you have to detect it. You have to consider all load condition, right? It's just not just because you fix it in one heavy load condition and then in light load condition, it's all uh, going mad. Um, taking, a, taking a very simple buck converter design, for example, one trick is if you look at the point we call the switch node, if you look at that uh, red dot, that's where the noise is generated because it's just basically bouncing between zero volts and 12 volts, let's say. And, and you, know, you can shield it by using a shielded inductor. But then again, this is the trick of EMC. It's not like, oh, you select a inductor or shielded, non-shielded, what's the current rating? Okay, you know, on the data sheet, everything looks okay. We put it on the PCB, then problem solved. No, you really have to go to the details. And we always say devils and in details because if you look at the physical structure of these inductor, for example, on this side, you can see these inductors. Some of the so-called shielded inductor has a little bit of metal sticking out. That is a small antenna. That is a small antenna. So you will, you will radiate. You know, don't, don't look at the size of it. Oh, it's tiny, but small inductance or small antenna at which frequency, you know? Once you're talking about hundreds of megahertz, tiny length of in, uh, wire becomes a, a quarter wavelength antenna. So here, um, I guess this slide is, is from, uh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, using snubber, right? With or without snubber, we all know how snubber works. It takes lots of the edges away, so you have a good, uh, uh, good uh, performance in terms of overshoots. Um, this is interesting. So we talked about DC link design. We talked about switching design. Now let's look at the future, right? So this year I had the pleasure of writing an IET book, which uh, Daisy, Daisy is the uh, author of the book. So I contributed a chapter focusing on uh, future with my uh, colleague uh, Richard um, Gibson. And uh, so, yeah, these are pretty much from the book. But, uh, but as you can see, you can see um, now we are, we are we're in a stage where we have new products, as Yegi demonstrated in the morning, such as a DC DC converter, where you have high voltage but low current, relatively low current, right? 400, 600, or 800 volts in a, in a car. Um, but if you design like say four kilowatts or two kilowatts DC DC, then you're talking about less than five amps uh, input current. But then on the output, you have hundreds of amps, 12 volts. So how do we cope with this kind of noise and, and huge current or big voltage? So on the input side, as you can see here, this is a Audi e-tron design. Of course, it's a multi-stage filter as we know, but look at how they how they try to be smart about it, right? So you got multi-stage filter, and in this case, it's common mode uh, choke rather than inductor. But the common mode choke is, is not by filer wanted, it's sectional wanted, so you will have some leakage inductance. And that leakage inductance actually works quite well with the blue film capacitor, which you know, provides some differential filtering. So effectively, you have multi-stage um, LC, LC, LC in the, in the circuit. So that takes lots of the differential mode noise away, as we, we know. How about common mode noise? Okay, common mode noise, we got common mode choke, we all know that, but also you can have common mode capacitor. Sometimes we call it Y capacitor. So that's where you guide the noise from positive, negative to a common ground or chassis in this case. So how to do that? Well, the easy way to do it is just use capacitors. Select a capacitor, do it straight away. Use one capacitor, two capacitor, that's it, per line. But in this case, you can see manufacturers actually go to the extreme to do this multi-layer ceramic capacitor array 
to, to do the filtering. Why is that the case? Well, first, if you do five capacitors in series, so then in terms of voltage rating, you can select 100 volts per, per, per cap. You put five together, you have 500 volts rated. Second, if I put five in series, that's okay, you know, I have the voltage rating, but I know if I put capacitors in series, that means I have lowered my capacitance value, and also there's lots of inductance when we connect the capacitors in a serious manner. So how do I balance that out? Well, what you can do is you can then put um, the same series of capacitors in parallel, so that gives you um, more capacitance. But all of this really is because the cost, right? It's, a, it's Audi, you know, they have lots of cars to sell, so every penny counts, every penny counts. And then, uh, then if you look at the Tesla uh, low voltage design, this is a, a Taiwanese company, Delta Electronic, did a design. But you can see on the low voltage, because of the current rating so high, you can't really use any inductance component. I mean, you can. You will have some uh, carefully designed air gap in the inductor, and then you, know, you, you, you can make it work. But it would be easy just to run the bus bar through a, a, a ferrite core. And you can see the, um, the metal structure there, fix the core there. You can use different types of core for a very wide frequency range as well. Okay, and uh, yeah, finally, back to the grounding structure, right? Grounding structure. This is again a DC DC uh, project I worked on. They made a mistake, right? So basically, they should have run the ground on the PCB, but they, they were running out of uh, space. So as a result, they have to take the ground, then use the, um, the pillar to the chassis and then coming back to the PCB again. So if you look at this, uh, the side view, again, it's a loop, then problems. So you know, they did everything right except this bit. And then you know, in EMC, even you do 99% of the things correct and you mess up with 1% of the design, then you have a failure product. So that's very unfortunate, you know? Okay. Uh, 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 you can, if you have a shielded box, right, this is very common in automotive, avionics and, and the military, shielded box solve most of the problems. But there's a simple trick, simple trick. So in automotive, for example, or any, any, any shielded case, if you want to do a shielded case, you have a lid, you want to close it, you can apply EMC gasket, of course, but the number of the screw holes is important, right? So for example, in this product, they did everything, they have the, the groove for the uh, EMC gasket, but if you look at uh, the, the screw holes, if I draw a line, what did we see? If I draw a line, the line cuts the corner, cuts the corner. What does that mean? That means when you assemble the unit, when you assemble the unit, inevitably you have maximum pressure at the screw uh, hole points, but you have minimum pressure at the corner. And if you have minimum pressure, field leaks out. I mean, it could be just millimeters, but again, as we're talking about hundreds of megahertz noise, once it leaks out, what's, what's happening next? We know now, if the noise leaks out through this small opening, they will couple to the cable, and then cable becomes antenna. Same story again. So that's why you know, we, we decided to talk about coupling and ground in, uh, in the beginning, so it helps you understand this. What else can we do in terms of design? Well. There is active filter idea. So this year, Texas Instrument had this chip that claims to have really good performance in terms of active filtering. I saw this news, and I think it's a really good device because for a long time, I never really believed any active filtering except for low, very low magnetic uh, fields. So there are cases, for example, if you're designing a product that uses electric beam or audio products, sometimes you have to deal with kilohertz low frequency noise coming from the outside, then what you can do is you, you have a loop created by yourself and then you just inject a current, which is the, uh, the opposite phase, so you cancel the, the magnetic field. Very simple to understand. But for high frequency, for a long time, I never really bought this idea of using active filter. But this is really the first time I look at the data sheet and I was thinking, pretty good, pretty good. So, and surprisingly, or not surprisingly, uh, when I was speaking to Yegi, they implemented this filter um, just as a backup plan, right, or yes. research project. Yes. So we're quite, we're looking forward to, to comparing this um, active filter performance to the data sheet to see whether, you know, they claim as, as good they are, okay? 
Okay, hand it back to you again. Yeah. Okay, so uh, can I have this? Um, yeah, so back to the uh, DCDC converter case study. So we have got, um, I've shown you how we test, how we wanted to test the, the emissions, how, what problems we had, and then how we were going to uh, solve them. So the first <coughs> uh, line, the high voltage line is the first one that I'm going to talk about now. Since we used unshielded cable in our design, it was quite difficult uh, uh, and we couldn't change the, the cable to be shielded. So we had to start using um, a multi-stage filter PCB inside our box. And there was another issue as well. If you look at that PCB, that's, that's our HV power PCB where we filtered um, the noise coming out, but then there is quite a distance between where the, uh, H, the, filter, the high voltage uh, uh, signals are getting filtered and where the connector on the man panel mount of the box was. So there was a cable going from there to there which noise could couple. So you, we were filtering it somewhere else and then it was getting bypassed. So what we had to do is we tried to put a multi-stage filter in just in the middle to get rid of uh, high frequency noise low frequency noise and also the noise that we were seeing in the FM band. Uh, so when we were doing this um, uh, test, we managed, we, we were testing just like a, uh, doing some connections in the uh, box and uh, we found that this is a, the best combination to get rid of the noise. But eventually when we're trying to design the circuit, the PCB, we couldn't actually fit the last combo choke, so that didn't go, but it was still okay. So this is how the PCB looks like, and you can see that's how our, our uh, HV power PCB. The uh, cable, it's not that long, I'm just showing you as a, a representative of how it looked like. Uh, so the, the signal high voltage plus and minus were getting filtered. In here we have some Y caps, con mode choke, and another set of Y caps, and then it goes out, connects directly to the panel mount connector. Um, so again, I'm showing you how we, so, and then we took, uh, we did some t testing in the lab at Lyra, and then we took it to the EMC chamber, which this uh, picture is showing you the test in the, uh, t uh, the chamber test house. Um, so you can see that it's, this one is the 800 to 12 volt version of our DC-DC converter. You can see the high voltage lesions, how the cables are sitting next to each other based on this standard. And here I'm showing you how the, the results were, looked like, in the beginning where before in, uh, apply all these fixes. So you can see that we've got lots of uh, noises which are these uh, coming from the uh, switching frequency of the converter and its harmonics. You can see that they're on both high voltage um, and low voltage uh, high current line. You can see lots of spikes that are um, the 50 kilohertz and its harmonics. And then if I go from 30 megahertz to 108 megahertz, we also had, uh, we were failing basically everything. Um, and then these regions were also making us fail radiated emissions as well. So after doing the, uh, making that uh, multi-stage filter PCB, we managed to get our noise down by 30 dB in some areas and even 20 dBs. So it was uh, passing quite nicely. Um, but our low voltage line was a difficult one because when I say low voltage, it's 12 volts, 300 amps. So you cannot put, uh, and we had, um, size constraints, so we, can't, we couldn't put any big filter inductors or anything. So the only thing we could do was put capacitors between the rails to chassis and between the rails themselves. Since it's high current, as you can see, we had multiple uh, MOSFETs in parallel, and then we managed to, uh, we had to fit more caps uh, for each half bridge, and our goal was to limit the impedance caused by connections. Also, we, um, uh, had we added m multiple MLCC capacitors with different values just to cover the wider range of frequency which we were failing. And also, as you, can, as you know, these uh, capacitors can resonate. So we also, as you can see up there, uh, put a resistor in series with the capacitor just to um, damp them if needed. So um, we also uh, made sure that we use small package capacitors because the smaller the, the package is, the lower the parasitics of the components. So that's also another consideration that we took. Um, and this is the uh, result. So that's how, we, how it looked like. It was failing. And then we made an, uh, around more than 20 dB improvement. But still, you can see it was still failing. Uh, that's the average line. It was still failing. So we noticed that 
the low voltage high current line and the low voltage low current line, they were coupling to each other. So by fixing that, uh, we managed to bring the noise on the low voltage high current line down as well. So we had to use a software switching technique to, ma to um, get rid of the noise. And it actually helped both high voltage, low voltage current, high current, and low voltage low current. So you can see on the right hand side, that's showing the average limit. Uh, and they correspond with each other. So we went from there to there. It was passing very nicely. I, I guess just uh, that also highlights Where this I'm noise I'm is, uh, yeah. <laughs> just want to add one more thing because yes. you mentioned it also helps the high voltage. So yes. again, this demonstrates the point that we wanted to make it earlier on because even in the lower in low frequency, it makes improvements on both sides, yes. meaning it is a common mode common noise. Mode noise. Yeah. Exactly, that's true, yeah. Uh, Okay, so for the, lo for the low voltage line, we um, had to do, as, as we showed earlier, um, a min slide where we had the uh, cut in the ground plane. Um, that's also showing the same control board uh, and how uh, we had coupling, because we had cables inside the box and they were radiating and coupling. It was just crazy. So we um, had to rethink about how they, that PCB was redesigned. So we, um, when we started looking at them, we had EMI in mind, looking at the components. We had to we made sure that we identified the areas and tracks with high DI by DT and DV by DT. And um, also, we, this is also an example of what not to do. Do not use pigtails when you're using shielded cables. Not a good idea. And also, as been explained, cables do radiate. So have that in mind. In here, the, um, we, on, the, on our control board, we had a little buck boost circuit, which is exactly the one that Min showed. Uh, so it was quite noisy. The layout was not good. The, uh, connect, the, there was a connector right next to uh, the buck boost circuit, and the filtered component were close to the connector, and also everything was close to each other. Uh, so what we, had to, what we do is we made an improvement, so we moved the uh, filter component closer to the connector and away from the uh, buck boost chip, we uh, managed to um, find out the highest high DI by DT loop that's already shown there, um, and then try to minimize them. We had to redesign, redo the layout, and then um, that, com that uh, in calm mode choke that you can see there, it was not actually doing anything in the frequency that we were interested in, so we um, replaced that. The, those Y caps were quite long distance from the chassis. We moved them around as well, and that little 33 micro Henry capacity uh, inductor was also not shielded. So we changed it to a shielded inductor. But still, bear in mind that even shielded inductors do radiate. So uh, this, is, this slide is showing you how the things that I just explained and how we uh, redo, redo the layout. So you can see that uh, in here, all the filter components, everything was next to the connector. And this is that's the block boost circuit. So what we did is we moved them closer away from each other. We moved the inductor, calm mode choke, the Y caps all the way to the right hand side where the connector is. And then we managed to put, uh, remove the break in the ground. We put just one solid ground. We used low ESL and ESR uh, capacitors on both input and output. And that made quite a lot of improvement. So this is how this, uh, this uh, cable, the emissions on this cable look like. And that's how much, oh. That's the amount of improvement that we made with uh, doing these layout changes, doing that software switching thing, and also improving the high voltage and low voltage line as well. And then we moved on to doing the radiated emission. So this picture is showing you how we did the test in the EMC test house. You can see the an antenna, the unit that's uh, set, sat on the ground plane where the cables are. So it's basically the same as this CISPR 25 standard for radiated emissions test. And uh, by doing all these changes, we managed to fix our radiated emissions problem. So from the left hand side, where for both vertical and horizontal uh, results, we were failing by quite a lot. We managed to pass with quite a lot of margin. Thank you. <laughs> so there's some. I think it's worth mentioning about this EMC and CI conference. Yeah. And also, can I say something else before we mention that? We, uh, I'm heavily recruited in Lyra, so if anyone is interested, please come and speak to me after the talk. If you, are, you, you, yeah. if you know any good power electronics engineer, yes, I would highly recommend to. working with Lyra. Yes. Yeah, Yegi is a good uh, team lead, and also their founder, Pete James, a very right. knowledgeable yeah. guy, often attends IET conference yes. in the so past. Yeah. Uh, and do you want to talk about the 
Oh, this question. I, yeah, I also just wanted to use this as a, a, a well, really like a, a advertisement time. Uh, we are also running, uh, when I say we, it's me and a few EMC guys in the UK. We, are, we run a annual EMC conference, as you can see here, called EMC Compliance and International. So often there are training sessions and also there are uh, conference sessions. And quite difference with what we, we are here is they are not academic at all. As you can see, EMC is all practical. So all the sessions, as you will see, are very practical. Um, we have industrial experts from aviation, military, uh, motor drive, converter. They, they, they come here, they do a presentation, 30 minutes per session. And it's a good show. So yeah, if you want, you can use the, uh, the promo code here. And, and as I said, um, uh, for me, you know, as a, a small consulting business, we are really um, deep into the EMC and, and noise issues. So if you want to arrange any training or any educational material, please do, do get in touch. I'm very happy to help. Yeah. There's a question. Okay, I guess question There's time. Question, yeah. 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 Just a simple question. Thank you very much. Professor. No problem. Yes, we definitely do that. So there are some things that, uh, some changes that we had to do on, on our onboard charger and DC DC converter that would mean that our losses would go higher. So we had we couldn't do those things. So we have to approach in a different way. So yeah, definitely that's one of the things that we do consider. Is a compromise? Exactly. You have to. There's a trade-off. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, we have questions. Uh, thank you to both for the presentation, and this is Chong from uh, Chicken Aerospace, and I'm not an uh, electronic engineer, uh, so it's interesting to know that you mentioned the ground, uh, when it's in charging or long charging, and the difference can be huge, and it's about 100 times. I'm just wondering, uh, from control point of view or from the system point of view, what kind of failure modes or consequence could that be? if that difference is in tens of microvolts or things like that. So what should we be concerned about that? Yeah. Okay. I, I can answer that. Yeah. Yeah. So again, this is a good question. So as I said, especially in the hundreds of kilohertz range, if you have common mode noise in the chassis or ground or whatever uh, you refer to, you will have loop. And this is particularly true in your application, avionics, military, or ship, naval, uh, naval ship application. If you speak to the BAE guys, they are always saying grounding and shielding. And they always say, you know, sometimes we try both ended shielded or single ended shielded. Because if you have a low frequency, as I said, low frequency, they tend to spread. So that's why I can measure that chassis plate because it's quite low frequency spread everywhere. And if you have sensitive sensors, right, could be a, 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 a pressure sensor, not pressure, um, uh, what, what's the word, um, uh, a, a, a strain gauge, for example, and you take the readings and you have to do the ADC and things like that. So tiny voltage you measured could distort your reading. So that's quite tricky. So often in those kind of applications, they use shielded cable, and then sometimes they connect only one end or the other end, what they do is they use R and C to block the low frequency noise, but in the same time provide high frequency noise as a shield. So there are multiple ways around it. But as a you know, potential hazard to control circuits, I would definitely agree, yeah, it's an issue. A uh, good example is in America, I have a client, they are building a one megawatt charging station. Uh, um, and, and, and they had issues with the control pilot signal simply because of that. Because the control pilot basically is a controlling signal in charge of charging and discharging, uh, doing the control thing. And then the noise generated from the power stage affects the control pilot signal. Mm. So we do see this in, in, in the fields quite often. Mm.